This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. Before we jump into difficult terrain and all the pain and agony that we both know too well in this country, it's good to start positive. And today yeah. is a positive day. So I'm going, I'm going to preface a bit. I'm not going to speak on your behalf. I think it was just a week ago, less than a week ago, maybe six days ago. We're talking about putting this episode together and you kind of casually make it known that you're going to be proposing to your girlfriend the day that we record (laughs) so i'm like oh this i mean what if it goes wrong (laughs) (laughs) we've we probably wouldn't have had this episode today then i'll just be (laughs) part of me part of me was hoping that we would but it would just be such a like (laughs) a very unpredictable different vibe (laughs) different vibe yeah yeah (laughs) and we'd suddenly be on bumble and tinder trying to quickly make something happen yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy she said yes. You, you shared the news online, so that's it's public information. Mabu. Yes, it is. Uh, Actually, you know, we've been going out for six years, so okay. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting her to say no, but you know, always in the back of your mind, what if? But, of but course. still, no, alhamdulillah, it was really cool and it was really nice. And um, you know, something at this point, I think we all need some new starts, whatever it is in life, just start something fresh, something new, and. That the excitement alone and just starting something, a new page in your life is always a good thing. So uh, that's well said. I'm super. I'm psyched, man. You know, we finally did it. <laughs> yeah. I'm. Hey, there it is. Mabruk. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for you. And it's an honor that you're willing to talk to me on a very important day. So that in itself is, is very meaningful for me. And honestly, I've been looking forward to this episode for a few months. And the reason I say this is because it's this country, because it's Lebanon, because it's a shared story, uh, we met on a tragic occasion. We met in person at Lukman Slim's funeral, at the memorial really? service. It was just days after his assassination. And I didn't know you. You approached me and you were very, very kind with your words. And you said that you're a fan of the podcast and that you sort of, you've seen me online in different, different areas and you were very kind. And I kind of, I wanted to speak more, but it was such a delicate occasion. And I think it was, it wasn't the right place to kind of properly introduce each other, but we stayed in touch. We exchanged information. And then it was just, I think, uh, weeks later, yeah. I'm walking down gymnasium and this sort of <laughs> larger than life car shows up next to me slowly driving and your window goes down you're like Tla. <laughs> i mean that's one way to see you again you know it took me a few seconds to recognize you because your beard had had grown in those i think it was maybe a month after or so so i kind of i had to second guess i'm like if i go in it may not be him it may actually be just the end <laughs> trying to pick you up <laughs> exactly but you said you know you said earlier new beginnings i'm like here we go <laughs> here's a new beginning yeah. i jump yeah. in and we had a very nice conversation on the street you parked to the side and we spoke for a few minutes, but there, there, you know, it's. I think it's the way you you talk, and I, I'm sure many people have have shared this with you. Uh, you're captivating, and I don't think it's the story that most people associate you with. I think you're captivating. Period. And I I, I say this with sort of some. I mean, I don't want to overstep here. The story is profound, but I think it's you, your personality. You're you're very charming. So I wanted to actually, you know, I'm like, let's let's make this happen. Let's talk. It took a few more months until I ran into you in Jamaisi a few days ago. That's that's the beauty of it. It's just, uh, you know, just hap- whenever it happens, it happens. Exactly. There's not really much planning going on. It's just, oh, it's time. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But I'm I'm glad we had that conversation in Jamaica a few days ago, because I think it's it's healthy to not. I think it's better to not repeat what's been said already. And I'll I'll start by saying that I really enjoyed your conversation on Saturday. I think I think thousands of people have watched it. I, I looked at the figures recently. It's something like thirty thousand or more. So you, there's an audience that knows your story well. For anyone listening and watching to this episode. I'd recommend going to that episode because that's over two hours of a very personal story and you're an open book. You really shared very, very intimate details of your four, four years and 10 months in, in prison. So that story has been shared. I don't want to repeat it. What I'd like to do instead is pick up where we left off in Jemaisi because you spent maybe 30 minutes telling me things that I haven't heard in a way that you deliver, which I think is it's a unique perspective to begin with. It's not on Hezbollah per se. I don't think it's even about one group or one party, or for that matter, it's not about Lebanon. I think it's the way you see, well, you shared it with me in person. You said that when you were in jail, you didn't see the bars in front of you, that you actually saw it very differently. And that was the beginning of, I think, a profound conversation yeah. and that you need to have dialogue despite all the difficulty, you have to talk and you have to reach some common understanding. And you were offering some history as well. And I enjoyed it immensely. So with your permission, if you don't mind, let's start with, let's start with what you think right now is the fundamental problem we're facing. And the reason I'm keeping it a bit vague is because we've We've discussed politics so much the last year and a half. We've discussed economics. I think all of us are financial experts now. All of us have a nuanced opinion. Hopefully, I mean, we, I, I hope people learned uh, from what we went through in the past two years. You know, that was a pretty good lesson to learn. Absolutely. And I think it's the World Bank today or yesterday. It's, we're among the top three worst financial crises. Since the 19th century. It's incredible. But, but that topic is being aired out. It's always on TV. It's online. It's everywhere. But your discussion about the feeling of or, or rejecting the feeling of being behind bars and trying to overcome and reach the other side and, and trying to find some foundation, a starting point, if we can go there and whether or not there is a fundamental problem that's being missed. And I hope I'm, I'm asking this the right way because I sense that you were looking at things from a unique perspective that many of us don't see and you do see a way out but it's not the usual road that we discuss. So yeah. I've already said too much, as, as much as you'd like to say regarding that, that issue. Well, first of all, Rooney, I mean, uh, thank you so much for having me on the show. Like, like, like you said, we met at uh, Lukman's funeral and uh, what an ironic place to meet for the first time. But um, I mean, I remember my words sort of, uh, I remember exactly what I said to you. And I, I mainly concentrated on the fact that I like how you speak as well. In your show, you have a nice way of communicating with your guests. And, and I, that for me, that was the best part. The subjects that you talk about are always very interesting. But the way you approach the subject from all these different angles and in such a calm tone. And I remember that's exactly what I told you, that that's, that's one of the main things that we're missing in Lebanon now. And again, it's just calmness. It's just the ability to just calm down a little bit and talk about a subject, whatever it is. So, I mean, if I was to answer the first question you asked, uh, what the, I think what the fundamental thing that's missing in Lebanon today, it's just a way of communicating. I mean, th you, you know what? Just think about it like this. I can give you a simple, simple experience that I went through in prison. But, I mean, you can apply this in any community anywhere. If you have different cell blocks and you have different levels of the building, like first floor, second floor, third floor, and then each floor has three wings, and then each wing has like 30 rooms or 30 cells, that's a lot of different rooms. And a lot of people inhabit those rooms. Now, if those people don't find a way to communicate with themselves or each other, then the only, then the, I mean, the, the people standing in between them communicating are two things, the walls, the cell walls, and the police officers that have the key to those cell walls. So just try to visualize it like that. You have a lot of prisoners and they're all cooped up in different areas or different cells, and they can't communicate because there are barriers between them. 
But if they find a way to communicate, they can override whatever barriers are there and reach the goal, whatever goal, I know I'm big, but I'll give you a funny example. Because they couldn't communicate with each other from the cells, they can't, they couldn't uh, get out of their door whenever they wanted to. I'm talking pre-2011, because after 2011, the riot that broke out at that point, right. they had broken all the doors in Rumia. So basically, Rumia had no more cell doors. You could walk in and out whenever you wanted to. We'll get to that in a minute, but yeah. the idea was because they couldn't, I'm talking about prisoners that couldn't communicate with each other, what they ended up doing was learning a system of tying ropes together where they would swing things from the little window that they had in their cell door from window to window, from window to window till they could pass a message. Or what they would do is from the, from the window of their cell, from the, from the other wall, not the door itself, from the window, they would also tie another rope and then from level to level, they could pass things. Now we're talking about a long time ago, but they didn't need to do that anymore because after 2011, you had cell phones in prison, you had no doors. So it was a lot easier to communicate. Right. But the analogy that I'm giving you is just that you need to find a way to communicate because if you don't, all these barriers and obstacles, eventually they'll break you. So in Lebanon right now, the, the reason why today you find this extreme depression. I mean, you look at people's faces, Ronnie, and you just, it breaks my heart when you look at people's faces. And the reason the people are getting to this point is because they don't communicate with each other openly about what they're living on a daily. I mean, think of how many things could be solved if we had more transparent platforms in Lebanon for different things. Like one, the Lebanese Lira's value, for example. I mean, one day, you know, the price shoots up, shoots down, market manipulation, you know, even when we say that maybe the people understand finance today, you can go down to the street and do like, um, just ask some questions to some people. You'll find out really how incompetent people are and how, how little they comprehend about what's happening to the lira, what's actually happening to the dollars, what's happening to the economic situation in Lebanon. After two years into this, we still don't have any um, significant changes in import substitutes, we still import you know, as much as we can afford. And all of these, for me at least, have to do with communication, whether it's in the government between the, the members of the, of the cabinet or if it's in parliament. I mean, come on, two years after all of this has gone through, we still don't have a capital control law. Right. We still don't have many, many little things that could have been passed if they communicated properly with each other for the benefit. I mean, again, let's not forget that they don't really care about us. But um, still, fundamentally, Roni, I think communication, when you find more uh, channels like yours out there in society and, and these grassroots communication platforms grow and, and like Serde, you know, Anjad, yani, all of these things can contribute to a more transparent community. And I know that it's funny that I, I'm talking like that, right? Because people expect that in prison, it's... it's um, it's more uh, rigid. We don't communicate and right. we're all tough people. And it's true. It is. It is very difficult. And for me to come out of there like this, uh, it's just because I was spending my time looking at every experience from a different angle. And it wasn't until after I got out of prison that I really started you know, going back to that period and, and remembering things that I've been through. And that's when I really started learning. Uh, and, and the change, I think, happened at that point. Because usually when you're experiencing something, you don't have time to analyze it and think about it. You know, Ali, I, I mean, well, going back to the, the immense negativity and depressed, de depressive feelings that, we, that we're all experiencing, and you mentioned it, and it's absolutely true. There's very little positive exchange in real life, online. Um, it's the occasions that I actually wake up with a smile and you sharing photos, and I think it's your family as well, sharing photos of you and your and your girlfriend now, fiance. Yeah. And it struck me that I may actually know your sister, Yasmina. Uh, yes. she, she was a classmate of mine at ACS, ACS. <laughs> from 25 That's years amazing. ago. Amazing, amazing. So when I saw the same <laughs> last small. name, I, I got really startled. I'm like, oh my God, I, I know her. Yes, and I know, oh, that's, that. you know, it bring, this country is so small so that small. these things statistically, they happen all the time. But yes, still, exactly. it, it brought some <laughs> fondness and, and joy and kind of reflection of my adolescence. And it took me places I wasn't expecting. 
And I remembered that you were saying issues about discussion and communication, and you're saying it in a way that resonates, whether it's something like this, whether it's independent media, or whether it's just the civility that's lacking. I think you're right. I think this is the way to do it. And it's still in its infancy, maybe, but it's growing. And I had a conversation with Karim Shayib. He's a contributor to the public source. He's a journalist. And he even said it in a way that I never thought of. He said, this is creating public space that doesn't exist. It may be virtual. It may be, it may be on websites and social media, but it's growing and it's there. And people can now talk, whether it's marginalized groups, disenfranchised groups, whether it's individuals with their own individual stories, whether anyone has been abused by this country, they now have a way to express. Do you see it growing more than what we have right now? And I'm asking it in a almost, a, I don't know if it's fair for me to ask it this way because it's a bit premature, but is this as far as it can go? Meaning that we can now talk, we can even talk in, in a civil way, in a calm measured way, and at the same time, the political collapse continues and the pain grows. So it doesn't really translate to anything other than we're able to talk. And I say this as someone doing this, hoping that this is a way to persuade and also looking and seeing the country collapse. And I hope I'm asking it in a fair way. But is you it, are, yeah, you are. Look, I mean, I think it's, it's just good to ask the right questions right now. Mm. Um, Funnily, yes. I, I, I think that right now in Lebanon, and I, I, for me, I've been saying this since the beginning of this, um, this whole uprising in Lebanon, that, you know what, disregard everything that's happening around you right now. Remember that, um, look, maybe you're right. I, I do have a different outlook on life and on how things should be perceived, at least for me. Mm. Right now, there's two things happening in this country or on this piece of land. You know, I'm, I'm not much of a big nationalist, uh, Roni. I, I prefer the term of this piece of land, the people that live on this piece of land, because over the past <laughs> thousands of years, this stuff has changed so many times. But right now, at this point, the Lebanese people that live on this piece of land, what's happening? Mm. You have an entire system, an economic, financial, security, political system that's been just, you know, rooted, deeply rooted in this country for over 100 years. I mean, some families, some powerful families go back a really, really long time. But we, they don't really surface. They don't show on the surface, but they have a lot of interests vetted in this, vested in this country and they have the power. What's happening now is we're just getting new generations, new blood that's beginning to wake up. We call them woke, right? We say these people are woke now. These people understand uh, the world differently. And I think that, that has a lot to do with communication itself. It has a lot mm -hmm. to do with the internet revolution. It has a lot to do with virtual reality and just being able to go on a platform somewhere where you can communicate with people that think like you, regardless of distance or where you are. And right, I mean, look, you were talking about information here, Roni, and regardless of what subject you're talking about, the more information you have, the better of a decision you can make. Whether we're talking about building a society together so if we need to build a society, we need to talk about many things. We need to talk about laws. We need to talk about social norms. We need to talk about how our economy, how we would like our economy to look like, how we would like to raise our children as a community. You know, these are all things that society talks about. But the problem in Lebanon is we cut off the oxygen to all the platforms, the old platforms that used to have those conversations. I mean, if we still have them now, they're run by politically... Uh, politically motivated or interest groups that that they want to they want to run things the way they want to run and we've seen how this country has been going for 30 40 50 years and it's not going the way we'd like it to go so, so that's one sorry sorry to interrupt Ali. Is, is the old way meaning just the the television stations that we're familiar with or the newspapers no no no, 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 no. no. i mean look the the interest groups themselves i know it it sounds it, it's it's something very very simple man. in the end of the day there are people that have economic power in countries. They own businesses, they own different things throughout the country, and they'll use whatever tools are available. Mm. So at one point in time, the newspaper was a big thing. So that's where everyone was, was putting their money. And now yeah. Yeah. people go on social media. So you have cyber armies, you have propaganda warfare. And what you end up having is just 
platforms um, which people actually go to for news and information. And that's really tricky, right? When you're not media competent, when you don't understand how to, um, how to differentiate between what, what is fake news, you know, what should I allow to influence my mind and my decisions? What kind of information can I give weight to in life? And that's the problem, that we don't have enough platforms for a person to be able to look at and compare with each other to make the right decision. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think about my economics professors a lot when I, when I talk about information, because economics, one of the most fundamental things about it is information, right? You can't make a decision about what to buy unless you know the price. What's the best price to buy this car for? What's the best price to buy this house for? So whenever you look at an economy and you want to know, is this country a transparent country? Does this country actually want the person investing to actually feel safe? You have a stock market because a stock market gives public pricing to the world to invest and buy and sell. And uh, honestly, for the first time, I felt like my country was beginning to become transparent when we had... Um, when we had platforms like um, LebaneseLira.org and, 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 you know, like those websites that came out that right. were actually showing you like a stock market value for our yes. Lebanese Lira. And, yeah. and honestly, that felt a lot more real than the sleeping pill they had us on for 30 years for the Alpha <laughs> thing, you know, and that, that all comes down to communication and information and, and just, you know, increasing transparency and allowing people to communicate about subjects where they normally can't talk. Ali, let me ask you, this is a very, it's a very astute way of explaining a fundamental problem that seems to be not in the discussion, or it seems to be on the, on the, on the margins. I don't yeah. hear people saying this enough, but when you say it, it resonates. And may I ask how you came to this conclusion? Is it, is it really from the four years and 10 months that you spent that this is the, almost the way to break free? from the cage-like conditions that you experienced? And I'm saying cage, I'm, I, and I, I'm borrowing from you because you referenced yeah. it as a cage. I didn't oh, it's a the, cage, man. It's a cage. Yeah. I mean, let, let's not sugarcoat. <laughs> right. So as it's long as I'm cage. not offending, I, I just borrowed from what I remembered you saying it. And that is, is this a, a way to break free? Because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious how you're able to come to this very, very important observation at a fairly young age. Mm-hmm. And... I mean, you're, you're in a way you're speaking to all generations, but you're also able to reflect from personal experience and it, it really resonates with me. So is this born out of before heading to prison? Is it something that came afterwards or is it from there itself? I mean, look, to be honest, uh, if I was, um, if I was this calm and, uh, and believed in communication as much as I did right now, back when I uh, was 20 years old, I probably would have never gotten locked up. Right. The reason, you know, like you know, I, as any person, I was just a young person, a hothead and all that stuff. But when I went to prison, like I said, when you live an experience, you don't necessarily observe it properly. You don't analyze it properly. So mm. I think it's the period of the past 10 years of my life. I mean, during the during the, um, the time that I spent in prison, the reason I, I talk and I'm, I'm able to communicate with all these different ages is, is just because I spent time with all these different ages. I spent time with so right. many different right. um, ethnic groups and religious communities and uh, sexual orientations. I mean, I got to talk to all the people. And the thing about um, the thing about prisons in Lebanon, specifically Rumi, is that it's pretty much just a microcosm of the entire country. So you have every background you can imagine that at one point passed through there. So, I mean, if you don't have a person in your direct family or, you know, like indirect family or a close group of friends, you definitely have someone in your neighborhood or Daya that went to room you. Right. And it's yeah. just, it's something, you know, like statistically, someone's, you know, someone you know is probably going to end up there for a minute. Yeah. But the thing is that when I was there, I had to make a decision at one point. And this is really a conscious decision, by the way. It's not something that's going to happen uh, without you saying, I want this to happen. I had to decide what I wanted to do with my time there. Because if you don't make that decision, you're just going to kill time, you know, and you can kill time with a cigarette and you can kill time, but you're never going to develop out of that. (laughs) So my conscious decision was probably around nine, 10 months through, because in the beginning, you're just always believing that I'm, I'm going to get out tomorrow. It's, it's going to end this, this nightmare is going to be over. But I mean, when I signed my sentence, 
uh, that said I wasn't going to be released till 2016. I was, I just knew it was done. I mean, at least the, the part of me that was, you know, super motivated to get out just sort of died out for a minute. And uh, I told myself, you know what, I'm here. So what am I going to do right now? And uh, one of the first things that I realized was I really like talking to people and I love listening <laughs> to people. You know, it's, I love listening to, to just stories and experiences because I mean, you don't have to pass through something in life to, to be able to learn from it. You can listen to someone else. You can listen to another story. And it's that point that I think I told myself that, you know what, since you're here for, for a while, why not listen to a lot of stories? Why not go talk to all these people? So I spent the next four years of my life engaged with all walks of life. I mean, I got to talk to, to, to all the religions. I mean, all kinds of Muslims, all kinds of Christians, uh, Druze. I, I even spoke to people that came from outside of Lebanon with different religions, you know, Hindus, Buddhists. And, and really, you know, at that point, it's a mind, it's just a mind opening. It's a mind opening experience where you get to a point where you say, okay, so what's missing in life in general as a philosophy, I guess, is just trying to create more middle grounds where people can come to without judgment and express themselves, express their ideas, express their opinions. And then hopefully if we respect each other and we value certain um, characteristics or certain, uh, we have certain values, for example, where we say, hey, Roni, listen, if me and you are, are gonna think about something, whoever can come up with the most cost efficient thought and the most effective thought, we'll go with that. That's a value, you know? And, and that way it's an objective value, unless uh, obviously there's, there's subjective factors when you wanna make such a decision. But again, when you have certain values that you agree on in any community and you create more points where people can come and meet and talk and discuss, you're always gonna have positive out, you're always gonna have positive outcomes. And that was my, that was the main thing that I did when I was, when I was in there. I just, you know, I focused on having a table and, and tables were very rare in prison, by the way, people ate and slept and, and did everything on the floor. Most of the time you, you were very privileged if you had a table and a set of chairs, I'll tell you that. Uh, but I, I ended up having a table and uh, my table solved two really big problems in, uh, in prison throughout <laughs> my four years. It was a purple table. I'll never forget it. It was a plastic table, but there were two, two problems where one people would get into fights sometimes, which was normal. You know, you have 900 angry dudes just sitting together in a building all day. Yeah. It gets hot. Sometimes it gets really annoying bug bites, you know, it really everything that can go bad in a day goes bad in there. So it's bound to, you're, you're bound to have anger and, and, yeah. and stuff going on. But one of the things that I did was I'd always invite people that were in fights or in arguments to come and sit down at that table with me and let's see what happens. You know, and we talk about their issue. We talk about what happened. We try to, we try to settle it. And most of the time it worked. I never had a bad incident on that table. And the, and the second, the second thing that happened uh, was we used to play a lot of poker. I, I'm a big poker fan, Roni. I love that game. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't even have to be a gamble. It can just be for fun, but, the beautiful thing about poker is it teaches you how to observe human behavior um, and body language. And, um, you know, like you can, you can lie all you want with your mouth, but your body most of the time tells the truth and you can't, you can't really control it. Right. So it was a beautiful, <laughs> it was a beautiful game that I played. I learned, I actually learned it in prison. So I, I got to play it. And instead of just playing to gamble, I was playing to understand body language and it was a really cool experience, but the, the prisoners would always play and, you know, when you're playing poker and the stakes are up and you're losing money, you keep buying in and the next day you have to call your family and explain why you lost five or $500 or $1,000 <laughs> gambling. And that would always cause a lot of problems. So I said, you know what, let me start a poker tournament. Let me see if this works. It was an experiment. So I actually said, okay, I have a table that fits 10 players and you can only buy in with five packs of Marlboros and uh, that, that's pretty right. much the currency yes. in their cigarettes. So right. Yeah. Five packs of Marlboros at that point was about 10,000 Lebanese lira, $10, sorry, $10. Mm -hmm. So it's a buy-in of $10, 10 players, a hundred dollars and the winner takes it all. So I tried this and actually because people were limiting their buy-in and because now the table was calmer, people had more fun. 
we ended up laughing. And even if nice. they would cuss each other out, it would be as a joke. Right. And I, I kept that table running for about a year, every night, every single, and it was illegal to play poker in prison, but we did it anyway. <laughs> you know, it was just fun. And we were, we were laughing and talking and really that table, um, it taught me so much about what, what communication does. And, and the funny thing is when I got out of prison, that's around the time where I started watching the news a bit more in my life. I hated the news in Lebanon. I hated politics. I hated the government. I, I didn't really care about anything. And now I'm coming up with a, with a, I'm coming out with like a personal vendetta type of feeling, you know, because I got robbed of my childhood and all that stuff. But when I got out and I started watching the news more and I started hearing more about Tawlit al-Hiwar, I mean, that really hit me. You know, these, these, uh, these motherfuckers, I'm sorry, but they, they want to call it Tawlat al-Hiwar. And I remember Denise Fakhri Rahmi when she said Tawlat al-Himar. And she really, she really served it proper because, Ya Ammi, if you have a table, Roni, for, for 20 years or 15 years, and you have the same people sitting on that table, and they still are not able to choose with all the resources that they have, then there's... There's just, there's one problem. The people sitting on that table don't know how to communicate, period. It's done. You, you feel me? That there's no, there's no other explanation to why a table that brings people together is not reaching solutions, other than the fact that the people on that table can't communicate. You know, Ali, I'm going to interject a comment here. Uh, I'm a big fan of storytellers. And I sense from you that you have a deep appreciation for just the craft in itself. <laughs> Uh, you have a way, and I'm sorry to sound cheesy, and I, I, I don't particularly like getting compliments, so I'm sorry to do this. I like giving them when I, when they're, I think they're well-deserved, so I'm going to make you a bit sort of, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I don't know anyone who can take me from a poker match and describe the table itself, or even just bringing prisoners together to mediate and knowing what it's like or imagining what it's like taking me from that very, very specific intimate scene to Tawlat al-Hiwar all the way out and doing it in such a natural way, you're a gifted storyteller. So I'll say this as a fan of what you're doing. Your story is powerful. Um, I think I think it's when, it's something I said when I, when I saw you last time that you took me on a journey that I'd never been on. And it, it touches on communication, but it's almost a historic narrative. And I sort of dance around this issue. Somehow, Hezbollah came up. Uh, we were sitting with um, Maryam Kisirwan, so Lebanon, Lebanon uprising. uprising. Yes, shout out. And actually, I did not know that I was going to see you. She, she brought you, you were together at the cafe, so I spoke to her, and then we sat down together. And I don't know how it came up. Maybe it came up with her or there was a side conversation, but Hezbollah, it seems like Hezbollah comes up in every conversation all the time anyway. So it's an <laughs> escape. Somehow it entered the conversation. And I found it very difficult to, um, to see the structure for communication when there's violence and real violence in the equation itself. And somehow that started a conversation on, on bigger issues. But let me, let me start there before we go deeper into the historical perspective, which you're very, it's a, it's a persuasive argument. But I want to touch on this issue because I don't think we honed it out enough. I sense that dialogue has been approached before when it comes to trying to at least pacify Lebanon. And that dialogue has failed many, many times. Um, it seems like violence wins and the argument tends to favor the violent group. Violence exists across this country. There's all forms of violence among all parties. There are violent people in this country, but there's a strategic threat that's impossible to talk about because talking doesn't get you far when it comes to a malicious capabilities. Now, I know this is a bit, we're, we're sort of going a different direction here, but I wanted to approach the subject with you do you sense that communication is possible in that setting? Not, not, um, so I'll, I'll give you a silly example. It's sort of, it's maybe too personal of an example. I had a great conversation with Jad Ghassan on his podcast. Jad Ghassan is not a Hezbollah fighter or a Hezbollah supporter per se, but he was willing to talk from an approach that is maybe more sympathetic to Hezbollah. Mm. 
And we had this conversation. It was very civil. Actually, I think it resonated well. That's the kind of communication you can build maybe with someone who's not in fighting on behalf of a group. Is it possible to do this with a core member of a militia? And, and if it is, if it is, how can it be done at least in the Lebanese context? Because I, I would love to go down that road. I think that's the road that needs to go down. And you said it right. If you can find dialogue and persuasion and peace in a very, very heated environment, whether it's a prison cell, whether it's a jail, whether it's anywhere that, that is conducive to violence, why can't it happen on a national level? And I'd like to go there. So as much as you'd like to say. No, I mean, this is a fantastic question. And it's it's normal to always go back to this subject. I mean, this is reality in Lebanon right now. And we're not going to shy away from it. It's something that we go through every single day. Um, and I don't know if I don't know if you know this about me, Roni, but I'm half Persian. My mom is Iranian. I mean, yes. Yes. I mean, I, I have to live with that. And my name is Ali. So you can imagine uh, me applying <laughs> for visas to countries. It's It's impossible now. But really, it's something, it's something to talk about. And look, the subject is, is really sensitive, but I, I like approaching sensitive subjects. I think that's the most important type of subjects to approach. When we talk about Hezbollah, we need to remember something. First, what is Hezbollah, right? Hezbollah is a political movement in Lebanon that stemmed from a revolution at one point, or not really, really a revolution, a resistance, sorry. So... You had an armed resistance that was um, aided and supplied by foreign powers at, at the point when it was established. But the incentive or the, the mission of that resistance at that point was, um, was, it was a good, clean one. It was just to liberate their land and fight for their families, you know, and that's always a good cause. That's a good cause. But at one point, and, and, and we're not going to get into the details of why that happened or how that happened, because yes. that's also a long story. But... The point is, when it happened at one point, what did it do? It gave a feeling of power to people that would be, had been underdogs for a very long time, right? So what, what that does is it brings out, it, could, it can bring out very good things inside you. And we, we spoke, if you remember, about the interview with, between Hassan Nasrallah and Gibran Twaini. Yes, exactly. And, and, yeah. and, you know, and at that point, I, what I told you was, if you go back and you watch that um, that episode again, you'll see a very different Hassan Nasrallah in terms of how he used to speak. He was right. also very calm, very collected. And the questions that they went over in that, uh, um, in that episode, uh, Hassan Nasrallah was trying to show a very good image. And right. even Gibran Twaini had asked them, you know, why they're not already in politics and why they haven't brought their resistance into politics. And I think in that episode, he marketed a very good image of Hezbollah. But... With power comes great responsibility, right? Spider-Man. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I was going to say, I, I mean, I, I've heard this before, but I'm not going to try to interrupt. <laughs> no, but thank for, you for doing for, <laughs> The thing is, the thing is that with power comes great responsibility. And they lived with this, um, this image, this, this image that they kept pumping about how they are the resistance, the real resistance of Lebanon. Um, a Muslim resistance to protect the ground, like um, um, some of their people say, we are here to protect you. That, that's when I stop and I, and I say, okay, tab, now let's look at where they are today. Hmm. Hezbollah today is made up of two different parts, two different segments. One are the people that are driving, they're in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. And, and I, would, I always tell people, stop thinking that Hassan Nasrallah drives this. He doesn't necessarily drive this. He's just a very good spokesperson. Mm -hmm. He is fantastic at communication. He uses his skill excellently. And uh, he convinces his people. So he's a spokesperson. But the people that drive Hezbollah, the interest groups, we go back to that word. It's one of my favorite words, and I like to look for them in all, in all uh, cases. But the interest groups that drive Hezbollah, whether they are regional powers, international powers, uh, whether they're arms dealers, I don't know. There's a lot. But these interest groups, they right now want Hezbollah to move in this direction, whether it's political pressure, whether it's anything. The second segment in Hezbollah's environment are the people, right? The people yeah. that wear the bulletproof vests and carry those machine guns and go into war. Yeah. The people that um, go and, 
and protect the honor of their of their sect. Yani when they say we're going to fight for uh, for uh, for Shia, and they are convinced by these things. So when I look at these people, these are very different because they are also an interest group, but their interests are very different than the people running the show. Their interests are usually they want to survive. Mm -hmm. They want to do so with dignity, but their idea of dignity is sometimes um, flawed because for you know, when you want to come and tell me, okay, I want to live with dignity, um, meaning I want rockets and machine guns and the ability to shoot. Well, uh, can I'm willing to make sure that my kids don't go to school. I don't have enough medical care. I can't afford, uh, I, I can't even afford a basic living standard to, yeah. to, to, to support a family. Then I say, okay, but then your idea of a dignified life is definitely flawed. Your idea of a pursuit of happiness is flawed. Your idea of society and democracy is flawed. But this is when you realize that these two segments, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Mm -hmm. They, they, the interest groups on top, they have the, they have an interest to run them in a certain direction, pumping them with propaganda, um, making them believe certain ideas. And the ones at the bottom have an interest of feeling that they are powerful, that they are protected by someone. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would do is going back to that prison story of passing messages through the windows yes. is let's find a way to communicate with the right ones. Let's try to find the skeptical people that are in that low segment and start talking to them about real issues. I mean, look, I'm not going to come there and poke fingers at them about um, Hezbollah right now. I'm coming to talk to them about something deeper, something that they have to live with every single day. Like, how, how are your kids doing? Really? And I know that this question is something that people say we ask all the time, but you don't ask it properly or you don't, you know, you don't ask the right people. Yeah, and when you say communication on that table has been exhausted. I say, yes, it has been exhausted, but it's been exhausted with these people. Mm, it doesn't mm. necessarily mean that you, Roni Shatah, can't sit down with some diehard people in the Hezbollah community and still find the common ground with them on something more humanitarian, something more, something closer to being, you know, just being a human being. How, how's life today? It's not good, man. And we all agree on that. So I think that alone is the starting point. That's fascinating, Ali. And I'm going to project a question here because I'm, I'm a, I'll say from my side, and I, I'm going to guess it's a familiar feeling. We speak the same language. We speak in many ways the same. We have the same tone. We even dress the same way out of, out of, uh, out of sheer, uh, this is how we want to dress. We're not trying to impress anyone. And, and I can rethink what is probably built in prejudice over many, many years, what a prisoner in Rumi or any jail cell or any whatever in Lebanon, what they are like. I see you. And suddenly there's a, there's a distortion. Yeah. And I rethink my assumptions and that's positive. That's positive change. And that I think is, is, is a form of communication in itself that you're able to take someone on your personal journey and they can relate to you and suddenly... They're rethinking many things. Okay. Does it take that kind of persuasion from Hezbollah's side? Not necessarily a militia man, not somebody who's at war, but would it take something like that for people to be able to find this common understanding or see things in ways that have not been seen? Because I, I agree with you. I think it is possible to talk to people that are suffering in ways you're suffering I think it's appropriate to ask the right questions, not out of sort of silliness and sort of uh, remote concern, but in real concern, even help when you can. But there's that fundamental issue, which is it's become something that it wasn't. Yeah. It's grown. It has, it has a wider story than just a Lebanese one. What would the mechanism look like? Does it come from the other side? Or do we have to do better at trying to bring people away from that kind of violence? Does it, I mean, is it both at the same time? And I'm sorry to be a bit sloppy in this question because I, I, I haven't really thought this through properly, but I'm wondering what it would look like if we're applying communication to the Hezbollah that exists now. Not the one that you described well in the, in the 1980s, not that smaller group, not the one in the 1990s that's willing to talk to Gibran Twaini, the one that's in sort of very different outfit today. One that's yeah. one that can many ways cannot be held to account. 
I mean, look, in Lebanon, no one can be held to account. So mm. we're not just pointing fingers at them, right? Mm. If, mm. If, you're, if you live in this country and you have enough armed people behind you and enough power and money, no one's going to hold you accountable for anything. Mm. But the fact that Hezbollah is this powerful and this, um, this visible, right? We don't know if the other political party, I mean, you know, at one point, Samir Jaja went up and said, I have 15,000 armed people. I mean, hey, that's, <laughs> that raises some questions, buddy. What's going on? But <laughs> the thing is, right, we, we, we might just be looking at the tips of the icebergs for the rest of them. But what we can tell definitely is Hezbollah is, is a powerfully armed militia. Mm. And they have a, a influential political arm. And they definitely have a very powerful economic arm, at least yes. enough to sustain them their own operations right. so that we don't go and say, yeah, they're, you know, they're they're still keeping their people alive. No, they're not. You know, some bread and frying oil doesn't keep you alive. Yeah. Eventually, that bubble will pop. Yes. But they're definitely able to sustain their operations. Hella. The thing is, you know. Are we waiting for someone else to do? Because I'm going to, you know what I like to do, Rooney? I like to rephrase questions sometimes or rephrase statements. What you asked me basically is, are we going to wait for the other side to start doing something? Or are we going to get up and start doing something regardless of what they're doing? Mm. Right. And for me, when I was in, when I was in prison, I mean, I couldn't expect someone to get up and have a uh, intelligent conversation with me. I had to strike those up myself. And you should see, sometimes I would talk to prisoners and they, they, they had no idea what a solar system is, what a, what a star was. And those simple things that we learn in the third and fourth grade, you know, I mean, honestly, ACS was fantastic. But in any school, you learn these simple, beautiful things that, that as a child you find fascinating. And I would find that fascination in the eyes of a 50-year-old man. And it's, mm. it's like, what? What do you mean a star is made up of gas? But Yeah. <laughs> And the thing is that a lot of people from Hezbollah's communities, a lot of people in Hezbollah's communities, like I said, what ties them to Hezbollah is not just the fact that they are, um, that they, that they uh, are with the Palestinian cause and that they are with um, fighting Israel. It's more that they want to fight Israel than they're with the Palestinian cause. And uh, for, for a lot of people that think you know, they are Iranian people, no, that's not true. I'm, 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 I'm half Persian. I'm telling you, even though Iran itself or the regime in Iran, so that I'm not uh, generalizing the whole country because, you know, we're trying over there as well. Yes. But um, the regime in Iran definitely has interests in Hezbollah. So they're mm -hmm. going to be driving it in a certain direction. But the people that live in the environments of Hezbollah, you can walk around in their neighborhoods and in, the, in their towns across the country. You won't necessarily find the Iranian flags. You'll find Lebanese flags. They might have someone in Hezbollah and they might have another person in the Lebanese army. Right. Right. right, right. And uh, a lot of times we find that the that army and Hezbollah, they, 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 they you know, not necessarily, I'm saying political, but Laskar. Hmm. They serve sometimes, you know, khayhon, khayhon, and cousins. Mm. So the point is that, yes, there are a lot of people in Hezbollah that they, they would be willing to communicate. They don't share 100% the brainwashing uh, values of Hezbollah. And the same thing applies on the rest of them, by the way, just to, just to keep this clear. The idea is finding the right people, finding the right subjects to start with. We all want to talk about, you know, um, removing the arms from Hezbollah and stopping what they're doing. We all want to get to that. But first, can we start with simpler subjects? Subjects that we can talk about as normal people. And we have no political, I have no political interest when I sit down and talk to Roni about uh, Saad al Benzin or job right. opportunities in my country yes. or uh, how to fix the gutter um, and the um, Sarf uh, al before next winter, so we don't drown in water. And you know, the funny thing is, most of the areas that Hezbollah runs drowns in water every winter. So there's a lot to talk about, and maybe we can start with those subjects. And the idea, Roni, is just offering an alternative platform. Whether that platform is a poker table, whether that platform is your show, whether that platform is a different system that can come together—an economic, political financial security system. I said security, I think 
that we're, we're, not, we're not people that are going to get armed anytime soon and get into a war. We need to get to a point where we can show people that because we're building economic stability, because we're building political culture and communication, and because we're offering financial opportunities, now we can talk about a unified security system. We cannot do anything until we get to that. So you I, know, I, let's be real. Who's going to walk into Who's going to walk into Hezbollah territory right now and 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 take their arms away? Who? I just want to know who who's going to do that because I can't, and you can't, and all of us put together who have tried can't. So we need to think of something else. We need to look at this from another angle. And I believe in people. I do. I always do. And no, we don't need to wait for anybody. You know, like whether you're a religious person that believes in these biblical stories and Jesus didn't wait for anyone, uh, you know, Hussein didn't wait for anyone. All these people, they believed in something. They just kept going. I'm not a religious person myself, but I mean, I look at these stories and I, I just, I learn from them, right? When you believe in a cause, and you say, okay, I'm going to try something different because I believe in it. Just go for it. Go for it. Look, you. Be, uh, what, what episode are you on right now? 262. 262, you know, times of you sitting down with different people and talk. I mean, you definitely learned a lot. Your viewers learned oh, yeah. a lot. And if I asked you right now, what was your, ep- your first episode like? I mean, what was it like? And what was it like to say, you know what? I'm just going to get up and shoot episode number one right now. What was it like? You know, I'm glad you're asking this question. I, uh, no one's ever really asked me this question this way. Um, I love storytelling. And I approached one of my favorite storytellers, Zia Dwayri. And he's in Paris. He hasn't been back for some time. I put some money together, booked a ticket, went to Paris, um, He invited me into his studio, his recording studio, and he gave me an hour of his time, a little more actually. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I had my microphone, I had an external one, and just sort of started. And it somehow made sense. It didn't, I was very, um, I didn't feel comfortable until it actually started then I said oh no this is yes it's working it's working and I I can relax Um, while I was there I reached out to Ziad Majid who was a friend of a comrade of Samir Asir Uh, I reached out to Yasma Flehan the late Basil Flehan's wife who lives in Geneva and Nadim Houri who ran Human Rights Watch in Beirut and uh, he's now Arab Reform Initiative in Paris so I, I literally just let it happen on its own flew back, put the episodes together and just sort of got something starting. I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, now I'm talking too much about me, but I, I, I Not see at all. I just wanted you to hear it, you know, like, yeah, it's what, it's what, starting. what the viewers yes. are, sorry, what the viewers are hearing right now is Roni explaining how passionate he was about putting together these stories. He loved it. And now look, 262 episodes later, and he's still going. Yeah. And for me, that's that's what we should be feeling right now, Roni. It's just it's not about um, it's not it's not about you know how do we start or will it work or will it fail. It's about let's just start. Let's find the one point where we can start something and just go for it. That's that's the feeling right now. That's how we should be thinking, and that's how I I thought when I was in prison and I just started, and then four four years and months later I walk out, and for a second I couldn't think. I couldn't understand how all that time went by so fast. Yeah, so fast. Right. right. Two hundred sixty-two episodes, man. You know. No, but I, this is a very nice way of 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 describing it. And I, you know, I used to actually make the episodes link to each other. They were stories that would continue. Nice. So Ziad Zwaidi's episode would lead to another story with another guest, but there was a common thread. And I, I really made a lot of effort at the beginning because I didn't really know what I was doing, and I wanted it to—I wanted it to work. And I think I, I understand what you're what you're saying in the in the background is that you have to start somewhere. And I'm not going to go to the first guest with like a fantastic camera crew and makeup and sound <laughs> engineering and all that. I'm going to save some money, get a round trip ticket, stay at a hostel. I, I booked an Airbnb, and just go. go and with a modest microphone and just start and i i i 
that does resonate with me that you can have, you can start somewhere. It's not that you're going to claim victory from day one. You may not even live long enough to do, to do that. And victory here by victory, I mean, rebuilding the country that we lost. It's not going to happen overnight, but you have to start somewhere. And that includes dialogue and communication. So I really, I really like the way you share your perspective and you tie it into the personal. And I want to bring up something that came up after Hezbollah when we were sitting together. I think the background was how much can be done at this stage regarding the protest movement. And this in a way will tie into Mintashreen and we can maybe sort of dance between the two. I was being a bit skeptical, maybe too skeptical. And maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong. I, I still think that there's two pillars that really bring people back together in this country, not necessarily in a constructive way. It's just that this is the natural inertia of Lebanon is from my understanding which is power sharing along confessional lines, this old, old way of doing business, outdated model, communalism of the Ottoman years updated during the French mandate. And this is the, the, the blessing and the curse of Lebanon, this very weird way of compromise. It's constant consensus. That, that's one pillar that seems to have withstood so much history in this country. The other one is capital it's money it's finance being able to pull in money being able to attract money being able to trade being that intersection of ideas and and everything and being able to translate that into something that generates income in lebanon and it may not be the most sustainable it could be short term it could be even inefficient and dysfunctional too but lebanon was the banking hub for the region Lebanon was the tourism destination. Lebanon did have at one point in its history, real estate of real value. <laughs> and, and Lebanon is known for that lethargic communalism too. And my, my take is really that should those things recalibrate one day, the, the desires born from the protest movement will fade. And I'm not being hard on the protest movement. And on the contrary, I actually... My, my desires line up with the protesters that took to the streets a year and a half ago. And I, I was there and I, I, I sympathize with those desires, yet I don't see things moving in the right direction. Mm. And I see Hezbollah withstanding the way you described it, able to sort of navigate this economically. I see the country collapsing and I see a yearning to go back to what keeps this country afloat, that outdated, odd way with some money coming back to the country. Now, mm. it's a huge, it's a huge way of prefacing this, this, er, this subject, but feel free to butcher all of this. Feel free to shoot it down. And you took me on a journey last time. You took me thousands of years back in time. We didn't have enough time to actually, I think the cafe at some point was shutting down. They kicked <laughs> us out. <laughs> <laughs> so we we didn't have time to go down that road together now we do you don't have to go i mean go as far back as you'd like B butcher it to death if you'd like but i really would appreciate your take on this and whether or not whether it's mintishreen whether it's any opposition group mm -hmm. can actually yield political authority given the way lebanon has functioned or has been dysfunctional for so long Look, uh, we, don't, we don't really have to go thousands of years back. I mean, we were talking about the different eras that Lebanon has gone through. Because yeah. like, I, like I said, look, honestly, if you look at life the way I look at life, you, you'd see it like that from a bird's eye view. And that's usually the best way to look at something because you're looking at it from the top side. Mm. In Lebanon, this piece of land, again, yes. uh, that, that so many different cultures live, so many different civilizations, and, and these people have evolved with time. Right. And today, just to zoom in right now to 2021, the people living here today that identify as Lebanese people split into so many different little subdivisions. These people have I mean, it's not that they don't have a common identity. You, it's impossible. It's possible to live in this piece of land and not have a common identity. We've been a country for 100 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have common food. 
But the only reason we know we have common food is because we've concentrated so much on tourism. That's why we know that we all eat hummus because we've concentrated. So, I mean, we made the biggest bowl of hummus in the world. That's one hell of an achievement <laughs> in, in 100 years. But here, here's the point. When I was talking to you about the Phoenicians, we went back all the way to the Phoenicians. That's what reality is. Reality is just a compilation of things that have happened over time. If you cut a mountain, you look at different layers. That's what time is, right? And it just physically there, that's time. So humans and society is also like that. It's a compilation of things happening. The reason Lebanon is a trading hub over the thousands of years that have passed is because this country was a traded world. The Phoenicians were, were some of the best sailors in the world, commercial sailors. They built cargo ships back then from wood and they traded. And then there's traces of them all the way in North America. So these people knew how to sail. These people definitely knew how to communicate because if you don't know how to communicate, you can't trade, right? And these people built a decentralized, that's what the Phoenician empire was like, where each city state had its own way of running things and they, they dealt with what needed to be done. It wasn't a very good system. It failed at one point, but the idea was it was a very strong civilization that extended mm -hmm. outwards and went went on to, to, to really do great things in their time. That's why we still talk about them till today. But if we want to look at the economy of Lebanon, when you, I, I'm sorry, I, I, don't I don't believe in right and wrong when we're talking about, um, about your opinion on things. So you can interpret something the way you'd like to. But when we talk about facts, it's, it's, I can come and I can say, no, I don't agree with you on that. Sure. Yes. When we come and we talk about Lebanon in terms of its economy, let's break it down to just really simplify the thing. An economy is built specifically out of two things. One, it's your resources. And under resources, I'm talking about your capital, the money that you have, as well as natural resources. Trees, right? They built ships out of trees back then. Um, minerals, mountain, oil, petrol, whatever, and it's people. Without the people, you do not have the pe you don't have the ability to use the resources. You don't have the ability to develop the economy. So these two things, when you combine them, you develop something called a market and an economy. And from an economy, you develop a civilization and people type. Fine. Now that it's simplified, now that we understand we have these two things, let's break it down a bit more. Because the people of Lebanon over the past thousands of years have changed, obviously. I mean, we, I love when people say we're Phoenicians. And when you look at Phoenicians, they worshipped the sea. If you go look at our sea today, Roni, I mean, it's beyond disgusting. It's toxic. <laughs> how, can you, yeah, how can we even claim to be Phoenician descent when we don't even keep our sea clean? We don't take care of our ocean. We, can't, we have no right to call ourselves Phoenician. But then... That's the people side. Okay, we adapt and we develop and change with time depending on the values, right? What we agree as a society, we will be developing and teaching our children throughout generations. And then on the other side, you have our resources. Type. The mountains haven't changed. Maybe our trees and our green spaces have been decreasing. And honey, we can get into so many things that we as Mentishreen have discussed in many, many ways. And you know, when you talk about, for example, the mountains, I'm just going to, small tangent. You know, we have a silsli shari'i with silsli gharbiyi. One of them is a green mountain. And the other one is just rock. Mm -hmm. But instead of going to the one that's just rock and breaking it to get the rock, we have to cut all our green mountains to get the rock. I mean, the ideas are just ridiculous. But we've spoken about many of these things. And soon, I don't, I'm not going to be talking much about this information just because we're about to release our website and we're about to release all of our positions, programs, and all the documents that we've been working as Mintishreen on for about a year and a half. And that's, that's an entire subject and story on its own. But going back to the idea of the economy, our minerals and our resources are still there. We still have these resources, but there's one resource that we mismanaged and we had it in abundance we had it in abundance and it was capital wealth in money yes and that's for many reasons the main reason by the way just so we this so i tell you why i said that i disagree with you mm -hmm. when you said the the capital wealth 
our capital wealth was an illusion. And I think the viewers need to understand this. This is when we start saying, okay, now we understand money. Capital wealth was an illusion because in the 50s, when they made the bank secrecy laws, the bank secrecy laws were made and put in place to attract illicit money. Mm. The bank secrecy laws were put in place so that in, during those times, there were revolutions happening all across Arab nations. So why not bring all of that money that's being embezzled out of their governments here? And that's what happened. That's how it started. People from all across the Arab nations that were embezzling money from their governments during their revolutions would bring that money here, put it in banks, and that's how it started. Then you had the whole thing grow. And with time, Lebanon turned into a financial hub. So that was going on. And then the war happened. And then after the war, more money came into Lebanon. As mm -hmm. Money was booming in the 90s, early mm -hmm. 2000s, you know? Yeah. And then Rafiq Hariri died. And then from there, we also had a, a period, maybe it was stagnant for a while, but let's go back to 2008, 2009. The whole world was crashing in an economic crash. And we got billions and billions of dollars placed in Lebanese banks. Why? It's not because Riyadh Salim is just some genius or anything. It's because the people were putting their money in the banks and the money which was going to finance certain things was not by the, the global crisis. We didn't really get affected by it. So people, Lebanese people specifically, and that created a surplus. So when we talk to Riyadh Salim today, he goes back and he talks about those golden times. We had all that money, all that capital. Had we actually taken that money and invested into productive industries. And when I say productive, please, let's not always talk about just khiaru, banadura, or agriculture. <laughs> there is so much that this country can do. Why isn't Lebanon today, uh, the, the Silicon Valley, in, in terms of tech and in terms of everything in the Middle East? We only talk about tourism. Tabiqay, okay, Lebanon is a beautiful landscape. We have really good food. We have fantastic music. We have very passionate people. People love watching us dance, Roni. They love watching us drink. They love watching us laugh. They love listening to Lebanese lame jokes because we really were for a very long time the heart of the party in the entire Middle East. But we're not like that anymore. And we need to realize that. We need to realize that Arab countries have developed. We are no longer the cool kids. I mean, God, come on, man. Keep it the ala hadam when we haven't even been able to, to just get ourselves out of a, a, a budget deficit for 30 years. You know, and then John Steele goes and says some smart ass things like, we should teach you how to run a country without a budget. That's not anything you should be proud of. But, you know, I, but Ali, I'm going to, I'll interrupt briefly here. And I, I you're, I, um, how do I say it? It's, it's not the, hmm. it's more that, do you think protesters that took to the street and huge numbers demanding change. Do you think those demands remain if those two other pillars go back to a point that is stable? Because I'm trying to understand, mm. uh, and it's it's maybe it's an it's an indirect way of trying to get at. Do you see real change on the horizon, and it's born out of the protest movement, political mm. groupings that are now very. No, I understand. Yeah, and, and, and the, the appetite of the population really to see that change and the old sort of things that kept Lebanon together in a way that's dysfunctional and you're addressing it correctly. So I'm curious, does this line up in favor for a group like Mintishin, whether it's elections or whether it's long-term politics? The, the, okay, the, first of all, the idea is that definitely the economic situation has a major toll on the protests and the movement. Mm, mm. I mean, just come in to break it down. As the economic situation improves, people are going to get more jobs. As people get more jobs, they're going to be busy. And as they're, I mean, yeah. just to keep it simple, and as they're busy, they won't be able to engage much in, in, in proactive behaviors, to mm. say the least. I mean, they could probably make a post every once in a while, but they're too busy. Right. Type. How do we, then we need to, we need to come to terms with, do we want the economic situation to get better right now? Or do we want to deal with this thing first? Mm. I mean, in a perfect world, we'd want the whole country to stop, put all of these people on trial right now, finish this, flip the page. 
But life doesn't work like that. We don't necessarily get what we want right now. Type. Mm. If the world is not going to do what we want it to do right now, what is actually happening? What's actually happening is that the system, the, the, the current regime that runs this country, the interest groups, a kid, they have an interest in maintaining the status quo. So they're trying to do what they can right now to figure things out, at least keep themselves distant from the corruption. And Ana Madakhalni, it's that group that's causing this problem right now. And everyone throws it on each other. But at the same time, there is a reality, Romy. The people running this country, they have lost trust. And everyone, and everyone all over the world, all governments, all foreign powers, they can't trust our government anymore. I mean, in a recent right. visit for the, foreign, um, the French foreign minister to Lebanon, he actually even sent an invitation to Mintishrin. And as a small political movement, it's something that we took, uh, we took pride in, that mm. you know, we are now getting called by, uh, by um, international people to come to meetings. And it was a meeting that brought together a lot of uh, Thora-born groups that had emerged, plus some uh, parties like National Bloc. And, yes. um, yeah. and the, thing, the thing is that these conversations are giving legitimacy to new people. That's the first thing to look at, Mahek. So as the country is beginning to fall, as these interest groups try to save whatever they still can, they really believe that they could save the country. their capitals, the barra, all of them, all of them have their money outside. They're betting against the country. Mm. They're betting it's mm. going to collapse at one point. Since they're betting it's going to collapse, then this thing is going down. What are we betting on as the people of this country? And Anna, as, a, as a young person that has a, my own business here in the country, that has my roots in, and I just got engaged, what am I betting on? I'm betting on the fact that this country, this piece of land, is eventually going to flip again. And the people are going to choose what's best at this period of time. And I can tell you, Manhalla, the change, it's not that it's going to come. It's, it's already here. The change is happening. My generation is beginning to take the reins of things in this country. My generation is beginning to get to the point where we say, Tab, fine, I don't necessarily want to leave right now. I'm, I'm actually pretty happy with this country. I like the way it looks. I like the food here. And I, I personally don't want to leave my family right now. I like being next to them. Tab, how can I stay here and try to make this work? I think the also, I, can... I think I think your dog would be very disappointed too if you left. Honestly, man, both of them, both, both. of them. <laughs> oh man, but the fikra, the fikra, Rooney is just if we were spending more time over the past two years working together as one unit, هذا البلد كلنا مع بعض to try to figure out things. And no type of can't we improve while the politicians in Lebanon are doing their little theatrics? Can't we come together as people and try to figure out the macro? of this country in terms of how can we improve import substitutes? How can we start consuming our local products? The thing is, you know, we always want to cast the blame on the government. At, a, at, a, at one point, when I started going down to the streets in October, it was very early on in the beginning where I told myself, and why am I going down and demanding things? To be able to demand something, you must believe and give legitimacy to the people you're demanding from. But I don't believe in my government. I, I believe I'm in a failed state. And if I'm in a failed state, how am I going down and asking things from this government? What am I expecting for them to, um, to empathize with me? Obviously not. They're shooting at me. So at this point, at this point, we need to realize that right now, you need to be concentrating on your locus of control. What can you actually influence? And you, Roni, for example, you have this influence over your viewers right now. When you take them through these journeys, through these stories, through these windows. Remember I told you that right now what's actually happening in Lebanon is people finally woke up or at least a certain group of people have woken up and realized that we are actually in a prison. Yes. We're in a prison and now we're seeing the bars. And, and the only difference between my experience when I was actually in prison versus the experience of Lebanese people here right now is that I used to see th between the slits in the bars. I used to look beyond the bars and think, you know, what can I do with my time right now? I mean, I'm here. And Lebanese people are too fixated on the depression, the fact that there's no solution. We've tried everything. No, we haven't. We haven't tried everything. And the, the, communication is the first step, at least. But there's so many things to look at in our society that have flaws, 
that we can start with بين ما يكونوا هو اللي عرفوا شو بدهم يعملوا يعني the question is Rooney does Hezbollah and these other factions do they do, does any single one of them want to take over the whole country then if they don't have the 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 the, the taking over the country then we have a lot of things that we can do but if one of them has a vision of taking over the entire country which i doubt Hezbollah has mm-hmm. by the way you know they would have done many different things what they do have is they have a vision of maintaining power in the country mm-hmm. deciding how things are run mm-hmm. deciding where they can get their weapons and do their things walakin do they affect christian communities in lebanon directly no not necessarily christian communities are screwing themselves over Druze communities are screwing themselves over when you have corrupt politicians in these different groups. The bigger picture. In this prison called Lebanon, the prisoners themselves need to find a way to communicate and build a new system. Seeing beyond the bars, the way yeah. you described it, and focusing on communication and uh, believing in that change and acknowledging that it has started and your involvement or at least your your interactions whether it's with mintishreen or other protesters or just the wider story at play i've come to know mintishreen largely through these communications and these discussions whether it's on social media whether it's invitations to these online events um i've had i've been lucky i've met several mintishreen members i did two episodes um with Samir Mkerim and uh, with Gino as well, Gino Raidi yeah. in, in New York. And you know, it's funny in case he's watching or listening. Uh, it was the most, <laughs> this is the most quiet, calm episode. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this is a completely different Gino and very thoughtful, but without without the cursing. And I was, I was like, oh, this is actually quite appealing. <laughs> I like this, but he's very thoughtful and he's, obviously involved in Mintashreen. I've met other members, Samir Al-Khuri, who I've met on the street several times in Jamez and Manu Khayyib. There's, a, there's yeah. a m- m- many members I've, come, I've interacted with, but the bedrock seems to be an online communication strategy. And that's probably because of COVID and also that the protest movement has dwindled to the point that people are expressing themselves more online than anywhere else. And that elections are still in the future. They're not happening right now. Is that the the method, at least in terms of dialogue and persuasion? Is it mostly trying to gauge an audience online? Mm. Is there more that can be done at this point? Taking communication to, to a level that could potentially change the outcome of the election. The French foreign minister arrives and he reaches out to you. And that, I mean, there's a representative at least, or there's some, there's some acknowledgement there, but is there, is there more that is being done or that can be done so that communication, communication becomes political and then there's authority with it too. Cause I'm yeah. my, my concern always as somebody with a small fish, right. in this, in this lake here is um, that it could be endless communication and then the same players are elected back into, into office. Mm. Mm. That parliament reflects exactly what it looked like in 2016. Yeah. And we're stuck. So I, without being hard on anyone, not trying to be even judgmental, just that, is there more that can be done? And is, is more actually being done? So somebody like me doesn't necessarily see it directly. Yeah. Look, the, the first thing I can tell you is that change needs time. Hey, mm. dear, I will show you. Mm. Hello. Is th- are things happening right now? Yes, there are a lot of things happening. And it currently, I'm, I'm going to talk about Mintishreen because that's my personal experience. I'm not going to sit here and generalize what's happening throughout the country. As Mintishreen, you mentioned some of the members that you've, um, that you've interviewed or you've met on the streets. We're basically um, a family. We like to refer to ourselves as a family, not, not necessarily a political party, even though we are a political party in the making. We're currently registering and most probably we're going to get the rejection from the Wizara because they don't want people like us to, to organize. Speaking of, we, speaking of we, family, we... Melissa Fethalla sent me a message asking, yeah. when, is, when is my turn? Because I told her we should do an episode together. So that's real family. There right you there. go. There's, there's another, there's another Mintishreen right there. Right. And, 
I mean, I mean, I don't know if the viewers pretty much follow all the people that you mentioned, but those are, so, I mean, we're some of the, I mean, in a humble way, we are some of the most proactive people in this country. Mm -hmm. we, we take to the streets, not just to, to burn a tire or to close down a road. We take to the streets to, to deal with the bomb crisis, to deal with COVID, to deal with the medical staff that needed housing, to deal with, with real life problems, real life problems. And yeah. I think our strong point was the fact that we were able to mobilize, even though we have very limited resources, in both capital and in human resources, mm. but we are very effective and efficient type. What we're doing right now, Akid, it's communicating on social media more. La'annu, it's easier. Right. It's cheaper. And look, if you want to turn on your, your van and go across the country and talk to people, it's going to cost a budget. And as Mintishreen, we are self, we're saying, we finance ourselves through ourselves. Which, which means that at this point, as young Lebanese people, our, our average age is about 30, 35. Mm. That, and that group of people, we're not doing too well financially, Roni. We're not doing too well to be able to do cross-country trips. But I can tell you that right now, as we speak, we have members of the country. We have in, in most of the big cities across the country, we already have Mintishreen members. And they have been members for over a year. It's not like they're new. Hmm. And the more important one is that we're actively going across the country at least once every weekend. There is a trip for a Mintishreen group to go to a different area, meet with people in different areas, communicate, open bridges of communication. And here's what I'm telling you. It's a slow process. Yeah. Resources are low. But with time, the communication on social media is able to mass broadcast a message. We have over 15,000 direct followers on our pages and in our network of people, you've mentioned some people like uh, sorry, like um, uh, like Gino Raidi and uh, and you know, a lot of other people like Muin and other people that are influencing and have people that follow them. So our bigger network extends to at least a million mm, type. Mm, mm. So it's a way to mass broadcast. But like you said, you need things on the ground. You need communication, and we have a lot of projects that we've developed. I don't want to talk about them right now. Because really soon people are going to get that, um, that full document where they can read how we as Mintishreen looked at the problems in Lebanon, how we envision a better country, and how we think we should get there. I mean, there's projects that need to be done. There are tables that we need to stop. And there are subjects that need to be talked about. And that's, that's I think, the strong point of Mintishreen is that instead of just saying we're going to do things, we actually do them. And then we tell people, look at what we did, go read it, and then let's debate, let's talk, let's improve. And uh, when you talk about criticism, that's that's what we feed off of. Honestly, mm -hmm. as Mintishreen mm -hmm. members and a lot of people that know us, know know our movement, they know that we are people that love criticism. We love, and, and when we were writing our political program, we even extended invitations to multiple other groups to come and join us in the research project. Because we read manifestos and we read different political positions on different subjects. And we wanted to have people outside Mintishreen with us in the debates. Mm -hmm. so I think our transparency and our, when we go back to values, the value of being transparent, the value of, um, uh, of reaching out and trying to solve the problems and then saying, I did this. These are the things that maybe uh, set us apart right now. And uh, I, I, I can't promise anything, Roni. I can't tell you that in the next elections, we're going to have a landslide victory. And I mean, as beautiful as that sounds, we're being realistic. In, in this reality, in this world that we live in, in this country and time, no, we probably won't have a landslide victory. But if we actively put together more of these tables, we actively communicate with the people in Libish Bahuna right now, and we talk to each other and tell each other, listen, let's really try to put together a unified list based on a program, based on political positions. Because, I mean, if me and you have different political positions on Palestine, we can still agree that in Lebanon, we have 68% of our land that we can uh, farm and make agriculture on. So let's invest in that. We can agree on that. You understand? So... The idea is right now, but between the people in Libishbahubad. When I say Bishbahubad, I don't mean nafs uh, loan or nafs al din or nafs al right. yeah. I mean in terms of values, in terms of programs, and let's debate them. And at the same time, we need to be actively 
talking to the other side, the other side that is not convinced by our uh, revolution. I call it revolution now, no, no, really, it's, it's not the revolution that we had put all of our hearts into. So I want people to understand that that's okay. Sometimes you overshoot with your expectations, but it's fine to understand that it's a longer thing. It's going to take longer than what we thought for in the beginning. We always talk about Lebanon and the Lebanese people. It's just the ones living here. But it's not right. true. That's true. The Lebanese yeah. people are all over the world. I mean, if anything, we are probably one of the most um, extended, um, decentralized networks all over the world in every country. And if, if that's not a economic asset to have, I don't know what is. We can move. I mean, look, if, if OMT closed down tomorrow, we could open up Lebanon OMT and we could run that tomorrow. We have people all <laughs> over the country, all over the world. And we have intelligent people, educated people that had to leave this country. And I think that right now, focusing on them as well. I mean, if we, if we want to give just a few numbers, in the last elections, you had 47% of the local population voting in the voter turnout. And you had only 5% of Lebanese diaspora yeah. voting. To, so what are we doing? We need to talk to everyone, man. We need to talk to the diaspora. We need to talk to the Lebanese people. And maybe the ones outside are more ready to listen, to try to bridge things together and try to do things together. I sense they are. Maybe It may not be a staggering figure, but I do sense, and I think it's, it's obvious that the political curiosity of the diaspora grew exponentially with October 17. And um, honestly, I'm always, I'm always impressed when, whether it's Mintashin or any group, is not afraid to talk about everything. And whether it's sensitive issues like Hezbollah, willing to discuss this. Um, I've seen it happen online where certain groups may be reluctant and they sort of step back. They refuse to take part in discussions. And Mintashin is there because they're ready to talk. Um, I also appreciate that it's a it's a variety, but it's also there is a youth bulge within it. I feel old when you say 30, 35. I'm like, oh, it's the younger generation. I'm uh, I'm the dinosaur now. <laughs> but it's but it's an important marker because this is where the protest movement really was. It's it's yeah. it's a youth driven it's a youth driven desire for fundamental change, yeah. and I'm always impressed. So I I. I hope you guys are, I sense you're in it for the long haul. And I, I think you're an inspiration yeah. to many people that sort of are letting go or giving up that you're still active. Mm -hmm. And I just want to wrap it up, Ali, with a very small question. Uh, we spoke briefly about a cultural center that may actually, it's opening soon or it's, it's on its way in, in Hamra. Yeah. If you could just maybe leave with a bit of a teaser of what it is and <laughs> when it's coming about and just a bit, because I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to end it on that note. I'd love to. I mean, look, honestly, it's a project that I'm taking on with, uh, with some really cool people. Uh, again, some super proactive people from the revolution that, you know, we got to this, we got to this conclusion. I, I like I said, I, for me, since day one, it's a communication problem in this country and communication or the skill of communicating or how you communicate is, is a factor in your overall culture, your culture. I mean, how do you live together as a people? Tag, if you look at Lebanon right now, we said that we're, we, we're, we're lacking platforms that help people come together and communicate together. Mm -hmm. So one idea that we, we got in, خلص, يعني, you just invest. And that's how you know that these people are invested in the country. It's not about getting on uh, platforms and just talking about things all the time. Sometimes you got to show people that it's time to do things and invest in a long-term thing. So what we're actually building is I'm working on this community center, but it's more like a cultural center. It's more like a place where people come to, to, um, I mean, it's, it's very much a combination of shared spaces, um, a place where we're going to have speakers and a bunch of things happening. And it's actually midway between AUB and LAU. Mm -hmm. And the coolest thing about it, I mean, honestly, it was, it's perfect that it worked like this is that if you grab the Lebanese map and you zoom out, I think by now you know that I love zooming out on things. You'll find that this place is actually the midpoint of Lebanon. It's in Ras Beirut, and it's like halfway between north and south of Lebanon. So mm -hmm. it's pretty much equidistant from the entire country, which is really cool to start with as a story. But 
the place, hopefully, um, we're running into a bit of trouble right now with the Beladi. And I mean, that's a story on its own, Roni. <laughs> right now, they had the entire project. They, they just stopped the project for the past two weeks uh, just because there's a tent on the front yard and the tent doesn't have a license, but the tent is 20 years old. So, I mean, all of this stuff. It's So the idea is that once they once the Beladi gives us a break and allows us to go back to our investment and allows us to go back to building this beautiful home it's gorgeous and hopefully i'll be able to show it to you within the next few days i'd love to take you down there and give you a sneak peek no i um, at what we're doing <laughs> and i'm glad we had this episode to to reflect on on dialogue communication and knowing that it's going to be more than just a cultural center that it's going to be in a way a breathing space yeah. for all of the above and I'm excited for you and, and everything you're doing, Ali. You're, you're a great communicator. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, I don't know if I would have stumbled. Up, I don't know if I would have known enough about your story had you not been so effective and persuasive at uh, making people reconsider many things. And you're talented. I've, I think people probably say this all the time. And I'm glad you got engaged. Mabruk, welcome to adulthood. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Good things, I think, are ahead. The future, I think, will be brighter. I think so. Yeah, and I, I think an optimist like yourself uh, is is something that should never leave this country. So stay as long as you can. Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much, Ronan. Honestly, this was this was a lot of fun, and I'm glad that we finally got a chance to to get together and do this. And thank you for the opportunity. And it's always look, it's always fun to talk to you. So hopefully. Uh, I'll be pulling up next to you in the, in the Jeep sometime soon and just get in and we'll just go do another. Uh, <laughs> Thanks to you. Be, because of you, I'll be jumping into random cars from now on. <laughs> That's how it ends. I'll be like, wait, you're not Ali. Oh, shit. Here we go. Um, <laughs> all right, man. <laughs> you're not from pleasure, Mint Machine. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, it's the beard. It's the beard. It's, it's yeah, the beard. It's the beard. <laughs> Take care, Ali. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.